THE GOLDEN BIRD A certain king had a beautiful garden, and in the garden stood a tree which bore golden apples. These apples were always counted, and about the time when they began to grow ripe, it was found that every night one of them was gone. The king became very angry at this, and ordered the gardener to keep watch all night under the tree. The gardener set his eldest son to watch, but about twelve o'clock he fell asleep, and in the morning another of the apples was missing. Then the second son was ordered to watch, and at midnight he too fell asleep, and in the morning another apple was gone. Then the third son offered to keep watch, but the gardener at first would not let him, for fear some harm should come to him. However, at last he consented, and the young man laid himself under the tree to watch. As the clock struck twelve he heard a rustling noise in the air, and a bird came flying that was of pure gold, and as it was snapping at one of the apples with its beak, the gardener's son jumped up and shot an arrow at it. But the arrow did the bird no harm only it dropped a golden feather from its tail, and then flew away. The golden feather was brought to the king in the morning, and all the council was called together. Everyone agreed that it was worth more than all the wealth of the kingdom. But the king said, "'One feather is of no use to me. I must have the whole bird.' Then the gardener's eldest son set out and thought to find the golden bird very easily. And when he had gone but a little way, he came to a wood, and by the side of the wood he saw a fox sitting. So he took his bow, and made ready to shoot at it. Then the fox said, "'Do not shoot me, for I will give you good counsel. I know what your business is, and that you want to find the golden bird.' You will reach a village in the evening, and when you get there you will see two inns opposite to each other, one of which is very pleasant and beautiful to look at. Go not in there, but rest for the night in the other, though it may appear to you to be very poor and mean. But the son thought to himself, What can such a beast as this know about the matter? So he shot his arrow at the fox, but he missed it and it set up its tail above its back, and ran into the wood. Then he went his way, and in the evening came to the village where the two inns were, and in one of these were people singing and dancing and feasting, but the other looked very dirty and poor. "'I should be very silly,' said he, "'if I went to that shabby house and left this charming place.' So he went into the smart house, and ate and drank at his ease, and forgot the bird, and his country, too. Time passed on, and as the eldest son did not come back, and no tidings were heard of him, the second son set out, and the same thing happened to him. He met the fox, who gave him the good advice. But when he came to the two inns, his eldest brother was standing at the window where the merrymaking was, and called to him to come in, and he could not withstand the temptation, but went in, and forgot the golden bird and his country in the same manner. Time passed on again, and the youngest son too wished to set out into the wide world to seek for the golden bird, but his father would not listen to it for a long while, for he was very fond of his son, and was afraid that some ill luck might happen to him also and prevent his coming back. However, at last it was agreed he should go, for he would not rest at home. And as he came to the wood, he met the fox, and heard the same good counsel. But he was thankful to the fox, and did not attempt his life as his brothers had done. Sit upon my tail, and you will travel faster. So he sat down, and the fox began to run, and away they went over stock and stone so quick that their hair whistled in the wind. When they came to the village, the son followed the fox's counsel, 
and without looking about him went to the shabby inn and rested there all night at his ease. In the morning came the fox again, and met him as he was beginning his journey, and said, Go straight forward till you come to a castle, before which lie a whole troop of soldiers fast asleep and snoring. Take no notice of them, but go into the castle, and pass on and on till you come to a room where the golden bird sits in a wooden cage. Close by it stands a beautiful golden cage, but do not try to take the bird out of the shabby cage and put it into the handsome one, otherwise you will repent it. Then the fox stretched out his tail again, and the young man sat himself down, and away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled in the wind. Before the castle gate all was as the fox had said, so the son went in and found the chamber where the golden bird hung in a wooden cage, and below stood the golden cage, and the three golden apples that had been lost were lying close by it. Then thought he to himself, it will be a very droll thing to bring away such a fine bird in this shabby cage. So he opened the door and took hold of it, and put it into the golden cage. But the bird set up such a loud scream that all the soldiers awoke, and they took him prisoner and carried him before the king. The next morning the court sat to judge him, and when all was heard it sentenced him to die unless he should bring the king the golden horse which could run as swiftly as the wind, and if he did this he was to have the golden bird given him for his own. So he set out once more on his journey, sighing and in great despair, when on a sudden his friend the fox met him, and said, You see now what has happened on account of your not listening to my counsel. I will still, however, tell you how to find the golden horse, if you will do as I bid you. You must go straight on till you come to the castle where the horse stands in his stall. By his side will lie the groom, fast asleep and snoring. Take away the horse quietly, but be sure to put on the old leathern saddle upon him, and not the golden one that is close by it. Then the sun sat down on the fox's tail, and away they went over stock and stone till their hair whistled in the wind. All went right, and the groom lay snoring with his hand upon the golden saddle. But when the sun looked at the horse, he thought it a great pity to put the leathern saddle upon it. "'I will give him the good one,' said he. "'I am sure he deserves it. As he took up the golden saddle, the groom awoke, and cried out so loud that all the guards ran in and took him prisoner, and in the morning he was again brought before the court to be judged, and was sentenced to die. But it was agreed that if he could bring thither the beautiful princess he should live, and have the bird and the horse given him for his own. Then he went his way very sorrowful. But the old fox came, and said, Why did you not listen to me? If you had, you would have carried away both the bird and the horse. Yet will I once more give you counsel. Go straight on, and in the evening you will arrive at a castle. At twelve o'clock at night the princess goes to the bathing-house. Go up to her, and give her a kiss and she will let you lead her away. But take care you do not suffer her to go and take leave of her father and mother. Then the fox stretched out his tail, and so away they went over stock and stone, till their hair whistled again. As they came to the castle all was as the fox had said, and at twelve o'clock the young man met the princess going to the bath and gave her a kiss and she agreed to run away with him, but begged with many tears that he would let her take leave of her father. At first he refused, but she wept still more and more, and fell at his feet, till at last he consented. But the moment she came to her father's house the guards awoke, 
and he was taken prisoner again. Then he was brought before the king, and the king said, You shall never have my daughter unless in eight days you dig away the hill that stops the view from my window. Now this hill was so big that the whole world could not take it away, and when he had worked for seven days and done very little, the fox came and said, Lie down and go to sleep. I will work for you. And in the morning he awoke, and the hill was gone. So he went merrily to the king, and told him that, now that it was removed, he must give him the princess. Then the king was obliged to keep his word, and away went the young man and the princess. The fox came and said to him, We will have all three, the princess, the horse, and the bird. Ah, said the young man, that would be a great thing, but how can you contrive it? If you will only listen, said the fox, it can be done. When you come to the king, and he asks for the beautiful princess, you must say, Here she is. Then he will be very joyful, and you will mount the golden horse that they are to give you, and put out your hand to take leave of them. But shake hands with the princess last. Then lift her quickly on to the horse behind you, clap your spurs to his side, and gallop away as fast as you can. All went right. Then the fox said, When you come to the castle where the bird is, I will stay with the princess at the door, and you will ride in and speak to the king, and when he sees that it is the right horse, he will bring out the bird. But you must sit still, and say that you want to look at it to see whether it is the true golden bird, and when you get it into your hand, ride away. This, too, happened, as the fox said. They carried off the bird, the princess mounted again, and they rode on into a great wood. Then the fox came and said, Pray, kill me, and cut off my head and my feet. But the young man refused to do it, so the fox said, I will at any rate give you good counsel. Beware of two things. Ransom no one from the gallows, and sit down by the side of no river. Then away he went. Well, thought the young man, it is no hard matter to keep that advice. He rode on with the princess, till at last he came to the village where he had left his two brothers, and there he heard a great noise and uproar, and when he asked what was the matter, the people said, Two men are going to be hanged. As he came nearer, he saw that the two men were his brothers, who had turned robbers. So, he said, cannot they in any way be saved? But the people said no, unless he would bestow all his money upon the rascals and buy their liberty. Then he did not stay to think about the matter, but paid what was asked, and his brothers were given up and went on with him towards their home. And as they came to the wood where the fox first met them, it was so cool and pleasant that the two brothers said, Let us sit down by the side of the river and rest a while to eat and drink. So he said, Yes, and forgot the fox's counsel, and sat down on the side of the river. And while he suspected nothing, they came behind and threw him down the bank and took the princess, the horse, and the bird, and went home to the king their master, and said, All this have we won by our labor. Then there was great rejoicing made, but the horse would not eat, the bird would not sing, and the princess wept. The youngest son fell to the bottom of the river's bed. Luckily it was nearly dry, but his bones were almost broken, and the bank was so steep that he could find no way to get out. Then the old fox came once more, and scolded him for not following his advice. Otherwise no evil would have befallen him. Yet, said he, I cannot leave you here. 
so lay hold of my tail and hold fast. Then he pulled him out of the river, and said to him, as he got upon the bank, Your brothers have set watch to kill you if they find you in the kingdom. So he dressed himself as a poor man, and came secretly to the king's court, and was scarcely within the doors when the horse began to eat and the bird to sing, and the princess left off weeping. And he went to the king, and told him all his brother's roguery, and they were seized and punished, and he had the princess given to him again, and after the king's death he was heir to his kingdom. A long while after he went to walk one day in the wood, and the old fox met him, and besought him with tears in his eyes to kill him, and cut off his head and feet. And at last he did so. And in a moment the fox was changed into a man, and turned out to be the brother of the princess, who had been lost a great many, many years. Little Red Riding Hood Once upon a time there was a dear little girl who was loved by every one who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother, and there was nothing that she would not have given to the child. Once she gave her a little cap of red velvet, which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else, so she was always called Little Red Riding Hood. One day her mother said to her, Come, Little Red Riding Hood, here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother. She is ill and weak, and they will do her good. Set out before it gets hot, and when you are going, walk nicely and quietly, and do not run off the path, or you may fall and break the bottle, and then your grandmother will get nothing. And when you go into her room, don't forget to say, Good morning, and don't peep into every corner before you do it. I will take great care, said Little Red Riding Hood to her mother, and gave her hand on it. The grandmother lived out in the wood, half a league from the village, and just as Little Red Riding Hood entered the wood, a wolf met her. Little Red Riding Hood did not know what a wicked creature he was, and was not at all afraid of him. "'Good day, Little Red Riding Hood,' said he. "'Thank you kindly, wolf. Whether away so early, Little Red Riding Hood?' "'To my grandmother's. What have you got in your apron?' A "'Cake and wine. Yesterday was baking day. So poor sick grandmother is to have something good to make her stronger. Where does your grandmother live, little Red Riding Hood? A good quarter of a league farther on in the wood. Her house stands under three large oak trees. The nut trees are just below. You surely must know it, replied little Red Riding Hood. The wolf thought to himself, What a tender young creature! What a nice, plump mouthful! <laughs> she will be better to eat than the old woman. I must act craftily, so as to catch both. So he walked for a short time by the side of Little Red Riding Hood, and then he said, See, Little Red Riding Hood, how pretty the flowers are about here. Why do you not look around? I believe, too, that you do not hear how sweetly the little birds are singing. You walk gravely along, as if you were going to school, while everything else out here in the world is merry. Little Red Riding Hood raised her eyes, and when she saw the sunbeams dancing here and there through the trees, and pretty flowers growing everywhere, she thought, oh, Suppose I take Grandmother a fresh nosegay. That would please her, too. It is so early in the day that I shall still get there in good time. And so she ran from the path into the wood to look for flowers. And whenever she had picked one, she fancied that she saw a still prettier one farther on, and ran after it, and so got deeper and deeper into the wood. Meanwhile the wolf ran straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door. Who is there? Little Red Riding Hood replied the wolf. She is bringing cake and wine. Open the door. Uh, lift the latch, 
cried out the grandmother. I am too weak and cannot get up. The wolf lifted the latch, the door sprang open, and without saying a word he went straight to the grandmother's bed and devoured her. Then he put on her clothes, dressed himself in her cap, laid himself in bed, and drew the curtains. Little Red Riding Hood, however, had been running about picking flowers, and when she had gathered so many that she could carry no more, she remembered her grandmother, and set out on the way to her. She was surprised to find the cottage door standing open, and when she went into the room she had a, such a strange feeling that she said to herself, "'Oh, dear, how uneasy I feel to-day, and at other times I like being with Grandmother so much.' She called out, "'Good morning!' but received no answer. So she went to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay her grandmother with her cap pulled far over her face, and looking very strange. "'Oh, grandmother,' she said, "'what big ears you have!' "'The better to hear you with, my child,' was the reply. "'But, grandmother, what big eyes you have!' she said. "'The better to see you with, my dear. "'But, grandmother, what large hands you have! "'The better to hug you with. "'Oh, but, grandmother, what a terrible big mouth you have! "'The better to eat you with!' "'And scarcely had the wolf said this "'than with one bound he was out of bed "'and swallowed up little Red Riding Hood.' When the wolf had appeased his appetite, he lay down again in the bed, fell asleep, and began to snore very loud. The huntsman was just passing the house, and thought to himself, "'How the old woman is snoring! I must just see if she wants anything.' So he went into the room, and when he came to the bed he saw that the wolf was lying in it. "'Do I find you here, you old sinner?' said he, I have long sought you. Then, just as he was going to fire at him, it occurred to him that the wolf might have devoured the grandmother, and that she might still be saved. So he did not fire, but took a pair of scissors, and began to cut open the stomach of the sleeping wolf. When he had made two snips, he saw the little red riding hood shining, and then he made two snips more, and the little girl sprang out, crying, Ah, how frightened I have been! How dark it was inside the wolf's! And after that the aged grandmother came out alive also, but scarcely able to breathe. Little Red Riding Hood, however, quickly fetched great stones with which to fill the wolf's belly, and when he awoke he wanted to run away, but the stones were so heavy that he collapsed at once and fell dead. Then all three were delighted. The huntsman drew off the wolf's skin and went home with it. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine which Little Red Riding Hood had brought, and revived. But Little Red Riding Hood thought to herself, "'As long as I live, I will never by myself leave the path to run into the wood when my mother has forbidden me to do so.' It was also related that once, when Little Red Riding Hood was again taking cakes to the old grandmother, Another wolf spoke to her, and tried to entice her from the path. Little Red Riding Hood, however, was on her guard, and went straight forward on her way, and told her grandmother that she had met the wolf, and that he had said good morning to her, but with such a wicked look in his eyes, that if they had not been on the public road she was certain he would have eaten her up. "'Well,' said the grandmother, we will shut the door, that he may not come in. Soon afterwards the wolf knocked, and cried, Open the door, grandmother. I am Little Red Riding Hood, and am bringing you some cakes. But they did not speak, or open the door. So the greybeard stole twice or thrice around the house, and at last jumped on the roof, intending to wait until Little Riding Hood went home in the evening, and then to steal after her, and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what was in his thoughts. In front of the house was a great stone trough. So she said to the child, 
Take the pail, little Red Riding Hood. I made some sausages yesterday, so carry the water in which I boiled them to the trough. Little Red Riding Hood carried until the great trough was quite full. Then the smell of the sausages reached the wolf, and he sniffed and peeped down, and at last stretched out his neck so far that he could no longer keep his footing and began to slip, and slipped down from the roof straight into the great trough and was drowned. But Little Red Riding Hood went joyously home, and no one ever did anything to harm her again. Hansel and Gretel Hard by a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter, with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel, and the girl Gretel. He had little to bite and to break, and once, when great dearth fell on the land, he could no longer procure even daily bread. Now, when he thought over this by night in his bed, and tossed about in his anxiety, he groaned and said to his wife, what is to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children, when we no longer have anything even for ourselves? I'll tell you what, husband, answered the woman. Early to-morrow morning we will take the children out into the forest to where it is the thickest. There we will light a fire for them, and give each of them one more piece of bread. And then we will go to our work, and leave them alone. They will not find the way home again, and we shall be rid of them. No, wife, said the man, I will not do that. How can I bear to leave my children alone in the forest? The wild animals would soon come and tear them to pieces. Oh, you fool, said she, then we must all four die of hunger. You may as well plane the planks for our coffins. And she left him no peace until he consented. "'But I feel very sorry for the poor children, all the same,' said the man. The two children had also not been able to sleep for hunger, and had heard what their stepmother had said to their father. Gretel wept bitter tears, and said to Hansel, "'Now is all over with us.' "'Be quiet, Gretel,' said Hansel. "'Do not distress yourself. I will soon find a way to help us.' And when the old folks had fallen asleep, he got up, put on his little coat, opened the door below, and crept outside. The moon shone brightly, and the white pebbles which lay in front of the house glittered like real silver pennies. Hansel stooped and stuffed the little pocket of his coat with as many as he could get in. Then he went back and said to Gretel, "'Be comforted, dear little sister,' and sleep in peace. God will not forsake us. And he lay down again in his bed. When day dawned, but before the sun had risen, the woman came and awoke the two children, saying, Get up, you sluggards! We are going into the forest to fetch wood. She gave each a little piece of bread, and said, There is something for your dinner. But do not eat it up before then, for you will get nothing else. Gretel took the bread under her apron, as Hansel had the pebbles in his pocket. Then they all set out together on the way to the forest. When they had walked a short time, Hansel stood still and peeped back at the house, and did so again and again. His father said, Hansel, what are you looking at there and staying behind for? Pay attention! and do not forget how to use your legs. "'Ah, father,' said Hansel, "'I am looking at my little white cat, which is sitting up on the roof and wants to say good-bye to me.' The wife said, "'Fool, fool! That is not your little cat. That is the morning sun which is shining on the chimneys.' Hansel, however, had not been looking back at the cat, but had been constantly throwing one of the white pebble-stones out of his pocket on the road. When they had reached the middle of the forest, the father said, "'Now, children, pile up some wood, and I will light a fire that you may not be cold.' Hansel and Gretel gathered brushwood together, as high as a little hill. The brushwood was lighted, and when the flames were burning very high, the woman said, 
"'Now, children, lay yourselves down by the fire and rest. We will go into the forest and cut some wood. When we have done, we will come back and fetch you away.' Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire, and when noon came, each ate a little piece of bread, and as they heard the strokes of the wood-axe, they believed that their father was near. It was not the axe, however, but a branch which he had fastened to a withered tree which the wind was blowing backwards and forwards. And as they had been sitting such a long time, their eyes closed with fatigue, and they fell fast asleep. When at last they awoke, it was already dark night. Gretel began to cry, and said, "'How are we to get out of the forest now?' But Hansel comforted her, and said, "'Just wait a little, until the moon has risen, and then we will soon find the way.' And when the full moon had risen, Hansel took his little sister by the hand, and followed the pebbles, which shone like newly coined silver pieces, and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long, and by break of day came once more to their father's house. They knocked at the door, and when the woman opened it, and saw it was Hansel and Gretel, she said, "'You naughty children! Why have you slept so long in the forest? We thought you were never coming back at all!' The father, however, rejoiced, for it had cut him to the heart to leave them behind alone. Not long afterwards there was once more great dearth throughout the land and the children heard their mother saying at night to their father, "'Everything is eaten again. We have one half-loaf left, and that is the end. The children must go. We will take them farther into the wood, so that they will not find their way out again. There is no other means of saving ourselves.' The man's heart was heavy, and he thought, "'It would be better for you to share the last mouthful with your children.' The woman, however, would listen to nothing that he had to say, but scolded and reproached him. He who says A must say B likewise, and as he had yielded the first time, he had to do so a second time also. The children, however, were still awake, and had heard the conversation. When the old folks were asleep, Hansel again got up, and wanted to go out and pick up pebbles, as he had done before. But the woman had locked the door, and Hansel could not get out. Nevertheless, he comforted his little sister, and said, "'Do not cry, Gretel. Go to sleep quietly. The good God will help us.' Early in the morning came the woman, and took the children out of their beds. Their piece of bread was given to them, but it was still smaller than the time before. On the way into the forest, Hansel crumbled his in his pocket and often stood still and threw a morsel on the ground. "'Hansel, why do you stop and look round?' said the father. "'Go on. I am looking back at my little pigeon, which is sitting on the roof, and wants to say good-bye to me,' answered Hansel. "'Fool!' said the woman. "'That is not your little pigeon. That is the morning sun that is shining on the chimney.' Hansel, however, little by little, through all the crumbs on the path. The woman led the children still deeper into the forest, where they had never in their lives been before. Then a great fire was again made, and the mother said, "'Just sit here, you children, and when you are tired you may sleep a little. We are going into the forest to cut wood, and in the evening, when we are done, we will come and fetch you away.' When it was noon, Gretel shared her piece of bread with Hansel, who had scattered his by the way. Then they fell asleep. An evening passed, but no one came to the poor children. They did not awake until it was dark night, and Hansel comforted his little sister and said, "'Just wait, Gretel, until the moon rises, and then we shall see the crumbs of bread which I have strewn about. They will show us our way home again.' When the moon came, they set out. But they found no crumbs, for the many thousands of birds which fly about in the woods and fields had picked them all up. Hansel said to Gretel, "'We shall soon find the way.' But they did not find it. They walked the whole night, and all the next day, too, from morning till evening, 
but they did not get out of the forest, and were very hungry, for they had nothing to eat but two or three berries which grew on the ground. And as they were so weary that their legs would carry them no longer, they lay down beneath a tree and fell asleep. It was now three mornings since they had left their father's house. They began to walk again, but they always came deeper into the forest, and if help did not come soon, they must die of hunger and weariness. When it was midday, they saw a beautiful snow-white bird sitting on a bough, which sang so delightfully that they stood still and listened to it, and when its song was over, it spread its wings and flew away before them and they followed it until they reached a little house, on the roof of which it alighted, and when they approached the little house they saw that it was built of bread, covered with cakes, but that the windows were of clear sugar. "'We will set to work on that,' said Hansel, "'and have a good meal. I will eat a bit of the roof, and you, Gretel, can eat some of the window. It will taste sweet.' Hansel reached up above and broke off a little of the roof to try how it tasted, and Gretel leant against the window and nibbled at the panes. Then a soft voice cried from the parlour, "'Nibble, nibble, no! Who is nibbling at my little house?' The children answered, uh, "'The wind, the wind, the heaven-born wind!' and went on eating without disturbing themselves. Hansel, who liked the taste of the roof, tore down a great piece of it, and Gretel pushed out the whole of one round window-pane, sat down, and enjoyed herself with it. Suddenly the door opened, and a woman as old as the hills, who supported herself on crutches, came creeping out. Hansel and Gretel were so terribly frightened that they let fall what they had in their hands. The old woman, however, nodded her head, and said, "'Oh, you dear children! Who has brought you here? Do come in and stay with me. No harm shall happen to you.' She took them both by the hand, and led them into her little house. Then good food was set before them, milk and pancakes, with sugar, apples, and nuts. Afterwards two pretty little beds were covered with clean white linen, and Hansel and Gretel lay down in them, and thought they were in heaven. The old woman had only pretended to be so kind. She was in reality a wicked witch, who lay in wait for children, and had only built the little house of bread in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked, and ate it, and that was a feast day with her. Witches have red eyes and cannot see far, but they have a keen scent like the beasts, and are aware when human beings draw near. When Hansel and Gretel came into her neighborhood, she laughed with malice, and said mockingly, "'I have them! They shall not escape me again!' Early in the morning, before the children were awake, she was already up. When she saw both of them sleeping and looking so pretty, with their plump and rosy cheeks, she muttered to herself, that will be a dainty mouthful. Then she seized Hansel with her shriveled hand, carried him into a little stable, and locked him in behind a grated door. Scream as he might, it would not help him. Then she went to Gretel, shook her till she awoke, and cried, Get up, lazy thing, fetch some water, and cook something good for your brother. He is in the stable outside and is to be made fat. When he is fat, I will eat him. Gretel began to weep bitterly, but it was all in vain, for she was forced to do what the wicked witch commanded. And now the best food was cooked for poor Hansel, but Gretel got nothing but crab-shells. Every morning the woman crept to the little stable and cried, Hansel, stretch out your finger, that I may feel if you will soon be fat. Hansel, however, stretched out a little bone to her, and the old woman, who had dim eyes, could not see it, and thought it was Hansel's finger, and was astonished that there was no way of fattening him. 
When four weeks had gone by, and Hansel still remained thin, she was seized with impatience, and would not wait any longer. "'Now then, Gretel,' she cried to the girl, "'stir yourself, and bring me some water. Let Hansel be fat or lean. Tomorrow I will kill him, and cook him.' Ah, how the poor little sister did lament when she had to fetch the water, and how her tears did flow down her cheeks. "'Dear God, do help us!' she cried. "'If the wild beasts in the forest had but devoured us, we should at any rate have died together.' "'Just keep your noise to yourself,' said the old woman. "'It won't help you at all.' Early in the morning Gretel had to go out and hang up the cauldron with the water, and light the fire. "'We will bake first said the old woman. I have already heated the oven, and kneaded the dough. She pushed dear Gretel out to the oven, from which flames of the fire were already darting. Creep in, said the witch, and see if it is properly heated, so that we can put the bread in. And once Gretel was inside, she intended to shut the oven and let her bake in it, and then she would eat her, too. But Gretel saw what she had in mind, and said, I do not know how I am to do it. How do I get in? Silly goose, said the old woman, the door is big enough. Just look, I can get in myself. And she crept up and thrust her head into the oven. Then Gretel gave her a push that drove her far into it, and shut the iron door, and fastened the bolt. Oh, then she began to howl quite horribly. But Gretel ran away, and the godless witch was miserably burnt to death. Gretel, however, ran like lightning to Hansel, opened his little stable, and cried, Hansel, we are saved! The old witch is dead! Then Hansel sprang like a bird from its cage when the door is opened. How they did rejoice and embrace each other, and dance about and kiss each other! and as they had no longer any need to fear her, they went into the witch's house, and in every corner there stood chests full of pearls and jewels. These are far better than pebbles, said Hansel, and thrust into his pockets whatever he could get in. And Gretel said, I too will take something home with me, and filled her pinafore full. But now we must be off, said Hansel, that we may get out of the witch's forest. When they had walked for two hours, they came to a great stretch of water. "'We cannot cross,' said Hansel. "'I see no foot-plank and no bridge.' "'And there is also no ferry,' answered Gretel. "'But a white duck is swimming there. If I ask her, she will help us over.' Then she cried, "'Little duck, little duck, dost thou see Hansel and Gretel are waiting for thee?' There's never a plank or a bridge in sight. Take us across on thy back, so white. The duck came to them, and Hanso seated himself on its back and told his sister to sit by him. No, replied Gretel, that will be too heavy for the little duck. She will take us across one after the other. The good little duck did so, and when they were once safely across and had walked for a short time, the forest seemed to be more and more familiar to them, and at length they saw from afar their father's house. Then they began to run, rushed into the parlour, and threw themselves round their father's neck. The man had not known one happy hour since he had left the children in the forest. The woman, however, was dead. Gretel emptied her pinafore until pearls and precious stones ran about the room and Hansel threw one handful after another out of his pocket to add to them. Then all anxiety was at an end, and they lived together in perfect happiness. My tale is done. There runs a mouse. Whosoever catches it may make himself a big fur cap out of it. Rapunzel there were once a man and a woman who had long in vain wished for a child. At length the woman hoped that God was about to grant her desire. 
These people had a little window at the back of their house, from which a splendid garden could be seen, which was full of the most beautiful flowers and herbs. It was, however, surrounded by a high wall, and no one dared to go into it because it belonged to an enchantress, who had great power and was dreaded by all the world. One day the woman was standing by this window and looking down into the garden, when she saw a bed which was planted with the most beautiful rambian, and it looked so fresh and green that she longed for it. She quite pined away, and began to look pale and miserable. Then her husband was alarmed, and asked, "'What ails you, dear wife?' "'Ah!' she replied, "'if I can't eat some of the rampion which is in the garden behind our house, I shall die.' The man, who loved her, thought, "'Sooner than let your wife die, bring her some of the rampion yourself. Let it cost what it will.' At twilight he clambered down over the wall into the garden of the enchantress, hastily clutched a handful of rampion, and took it to his wife. She at once made herself a salad of it, and ate it greedily. It tasted so good to her, so very good, that the next day she longed for it three times as much as before. If he was to have any rest, her husband must once more descend into the garden. In the gloom of evening, therefore, he let himself down again. But when he had clambered down the wall he was terribly afraid, for he saw the enchantress standing before him. "'How can you dare,' said she, with angry look, "'descend into my garden and steal my rampion like a thief?' you shall suffer for it ah answered he let mercy take the place of justice i only made up my mind to do it for necessity my wife saw your rampion from the window and felt such a longing for it that she would have died if she had not got some to eat then the enchantress allowed her anger to be softened and said to him if the case be as you say I will allow you to take away with you as much rampion as you will. Only I make one condition. You must give me the child which your wife will bring into the world. It shall be well treated, and I will care for it like a mother." The man, in his terror, consented to everything, and when the woman was brought to bed, the enchantress appeared at once, gave the child the name of Rapunzel, and took it away with her. Rapunzel grew into the most beautiful child under the sun. When she was twelve years old, the enchantress shut her into a tower, which lay in a forest, and had neither stairs nor door, but quite at the top was a little window. When the enchantress wanted to go in, she placed herself beneath it, and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel! Let down your hair to me. Rapunzel had magnificent long hair, fine as spun gold, and when she heard the voice of the enchantress she unfastened her braided tresses, wound them round one of the hooks of the window above, and then the hair fell twenty ells down, and the enchantress climbed up by it. After a year or two it came to pass that the king's son rode through the forest and passed by the tower. Then he heard a song, which was so charming that he stood still and listened. This was Rapunzel, who in her solitude passed her time in letting her sweet voice resound. The king's son wanted to climb up to her, and looked for the door of the tower, but none was to be found. He rode home. But the singing had so deeply touched his heart that every day he went out into the forest and listened to it. Once, when he was thus standing behind a tree, he saw that an enchantress came there, and he heard how she cried, "'Rapunzel! Rapunzel! Let down your hair to me!' Then Rapunzel let down the braids of her hair, and the enchantress climbed up to her. "'If that is the ladder by which one mounts, I too will try my fortune,' said he, 
and the next day, when it began to grow dark, he went to the tower and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Immediately the hair fell down, and the king's son climbed up. At first Rapunzel was terribly frightened when a man, such as her eyes had never yet beheld, came to her. But the king's son began to talk to her quite like a friend, and told her that his heart had been so stirred that it had let him have no rest, and he had been forced to see her. Then Rapunzel lost her fear, and when he asked her if she would take him for her husband, and she saw that he was young and handsome, she thought, he will love me more than old Dame Gothel does. And she said yes, and laid her hand in his. She said, I will willingly go away with you, but I do not know how to get down. Bring with you a skein of milk every time that you come, and I will weave a ladder with it, and when that is ready I will descend, and you will take me on your horse. They agreed that until that time he should come to her every evening, for the old woman came by day. The enchantress remarked nothing of this, until once Rapunzel said to her, "'Tell me, Dame Gothel, how it happens that you are so much heavier for me to draw up than the young king's son. He is with me in a moment.' "'Ah, you wicked child!' cried the enchantress. What do I hear you say? I thought I had separated you from all the world, and yet you have deceived me." In her anger she clutched Rapunzel's beautiful tresses, wrapped them twice around her left hand, seized a pair of scissors with the right, and snip-snap they were cut off, and the lovely braids lay on the ground. Then she was so pitiless that she took poor Rapunzel into a desert where she had to live in great grief and misery. On the same day that she had cast out Rapunzel, however, the enchantress fastened the braids of hair, which she had cut off, to the hook of the window, and when the king's son came and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. She let the hair down. The king's son ascended, but instead of finding his dearest Rapunzel, he found the enchantress, who gazed at him with wicked and venomous looks. Ha! she cried mockingly. You would fetch your dearest, but the beautiful bird sits no longer singing in the nest. The cat has got it, and will scratch out your eyes as well. Rapunzel is lost to you. You will never see her again. The king's son was beside himself with pain, and in his despair he leapt down from the tower. He escaped with his life, but the thorns into which he fell pierced his eyes. Then he wandered quite blind about the forest, ate nothing but roots and berries, and did naught but lament and weep over the loss of his dearest wife. Thus he roamed about in misery for some years and at length came to the desert where Rapunzel, with the twins to which she had given birth, a boy and a girl, lived in wretchedness. He heard a voice, and it seemed so familiar to him that he went towards it, and when he approached Rapunzel knew him, and fell on his neck, and wept. Two of her tears wetted his eyes, and they grew clear again, and he could see with them as before. He led her to his kingdom, where he was joyfully received, and they lived a long time afterwards, happy and contented. Tom Thumb A poor woodman sat in his cottage one night, smoking his pipe by the fireside, while his wife sat by his side, spinning. "'How lonely it is, wife,' said he, as he puffed out a long curl of smoke, for you and me to sit here by ourselves, without any children to play about and amuse us, while other people seem so happy and merry with their children. "'What you say is very true,' said the wife, sighing and turning round her wheel. "'How happy should I be if I had but one child! If it were ever so small, 
Yea, if it were no bigger than my thumb, I should be very happy and love it dearly. Now, odd as you may think it, it came to pass that this good woman's wish was fulfilled just in the very way she had wished it, for not long afterwards she had a little boy, who was quite healthy and strong, but was not much bigger than my thumb. So they said, Well, we cannot say we have not got what we wished for, and little as he is, we will love him dearly. And they called him Thomas Thumb. They gave him plenty of food, yet for all they could do he never grew bigger, but kept just the same size as he had been when he was born. Still his eyes were sharp and sparkling, and he soon showed himself to be a clever little fellow who always knew well what he was about. One day, as the woodman was getting ready to go into the wood to cut fuel, he said, "'I wish I had someone to bring the cart after me, for I want to make haste.' "'Oh, father!' cried Tom. "'I will take care of that. The cart shall be in the wood by the time you want it.' Then the woodman laughed, and said, oh, "'How can that be? You cannot reach up to the horse's bridle.' "'Never mind that, father,' said Tom. "'If my mother will only harness the horse, I will get into his ear and tell him which way to go.' "'Well,' said the father, "'we will try for once.' When the time came, the mother harnessed the horse to the cart and put Tom into his ear. And as he sat there, the little man told the beast how to go, crying out, "'Go on!' and "'Stop!' as he wanted. And thus the horse went on just as well as if the woodman had driven it himself into the wood. It happened that as the horse was going a little too fast, and Tom was calling out, "'Gently! Gently!' two strangers came up. "'What an odd thing that is,' said one. "'There is a cart going along, and I hear a carter talking to the horse, but yet I can see no one.' "'That is queer indeed,' said the other. "'Let us follow the cart and see where it goes.' So they went on into the wood, till at last they came to the place where the woodman was. Then Tom Thumb, seeing his father, cried out, See, father, here I am with the cart, all right and safe. Now take me down. So his father took hold of the horse with one hand, and with the other took his son out of the horse's ear, and put him down upon a straw, where he sat as merry as you please. The two strangers were all this time looking on, and did not know what to say for wonder. At last one took the other aside, and said, that little urchin will make our fortune, if we can get him and carry him about from town to town as a show. We must buy him. So they went up to the woodman and asked him what he would take for the little man. He will be better off, said they, with us than with you. I won't sell him at all, said the father. My own flesh and blood is dearer to me than all the silver and gold in the world. But Tom, hearing of the bargain they wanted to make, crept up his father's coat to his shoulder, and whispered in his ear, "'Take the money, father, and let them have me. I'll soon come back to you.' So the woodman at last said he would sell Tom to the strangers for a large piece of gold, and they paid the price. "'Where would you like to sit?' said one of them. "'Oh, put me on the rim of your hat.' That will be a nice gallery for me. I can walk about there and see the country as we go along. So they did as he wished, and when Tom had taken leave of his father, they took him away with them. They journeyed on till it began to be dusky, and then the little man said, Let me get down. I'm tired. So the man took off his hat and put him down on a clod of earth in a ploughed field by the side of the road but Tom ran about amongst the furrows, and at last slipped into an old mouse-hole. "'Good night, my masters,' said he. "'I'm off. Mind and look sharp after me the next time.' Then they ran at once to the place and poked the ends of their sticks into the mouse-hole, but all in vain. Tom only crawled farther and farther in, 
and at last it became quite dark, so that they were forced to go their way without their prize, as sulky as could be. When Tom found they were gone, he came out of his hiding-place. "'What dangerous walking it is,' said he, "'in this ploughed field. If I were to fall from one of these great clods, I should undoubtedly break my neck.' At last, by good luck, he found a large, empty snail-shell. "'This is lucky,' said he. "'I can sleep here very well.' And in he crept. Just as he was falling asleep, he heard two men passing by, chatting together, and one said to the other, "'How can we rob that rich parson's house of his silver and gold?' "'I'll tell you,' cried Tom. "'What noise was that?' said the thief, frightened. "'I'm sure I heard someone speak.' They stood listening, and Tom said, "'Take me with you, and I'll soon show you how to get the parson's money. But where are you?' said they. "'Look about on the ground,' answered he, "'and listen where the sound comes from.' At last the thieves found him out, and lifted him up in their hands. "'You little urchin,' they said, "'what can you do for us?' "'Why, I can get between the iron window-bars of the parson's house, and throw you out whatever you want.' Mm, "'That's a good thought,' said the thieves. "'Come along. We shall see what you can do.' When they came to the parson's house, Tom slipped through the window-bars into the room and then called out as loud as he could bawl, "'Will you have all that is here?' At this the thieves were frightened, and said, "'Softly, softly, speak low, that you may not awaken anybody.' But Tom seemed as if he did not understand them, and bawled out again, "'How much will you have? Shall I throw it all out?' Now the cook lay in the next room and hearing a noise, she raised herself up in her bed and listened. Meantime the thieves were frightened, and ran off a little way. But at last they plucked up their hearts, and said, "'This little urchin is only trying to make fools of us.' So they came back, and whispered softly to him, saying, "'Now let us have no more of your roguish jokes, but throw us out some of the money.' Then Tom called out as loud as he could, "'Very well. Hold your hands. Here it comes.' The cook heard this quite plain, so she sprang out of her bed and ran to the open door. The thieves ran off as if a wolf was at their tails, and the maid, having groped about and found nothing, went away for a light. By the time she came back Tom had slipped off into the barn, and when she looked about, and searched every hole and corner, and found nobody, she went to bed, thinking she must have been dreaming with her eyes open. The little man crawled about in the hayloft, and at last found a snug place to finish his night's rest in. So he laid himself down, meaning to sleep till daylight, and then find his way home to his father and mother. But, alas! How woefully he was undone! What crosses and sorrows happen to us all in this world! The cook got up early, before daybreak, to feed the cows, and going straight to the hayloft, carried away a large bundle of hay, with the little man in the middle of it, fast asleep. He still, however, slept on, and did not awake till he found himself in the mouth of a cow for the cook had put the hay into the cow's rick, and the cow had taken Tom up in a mouthful of it. "'Good lack a day!' said he. "'How came I to tumble into the mill?' But he soon found out where he really was, and was forced to have all his wits about him, that he might not get between the cow's teeth, and so be crushed to death. At last down he went into her stomach, it is rather dark, said he. They forgot to build windows in this room to let the sun in. A candle would be no bad thing. Though he made the best of his bad luck, he did not like his quarters at all, and the worst of it was 
that more and more hay was always coming down, and the space left for him became smaller and smaller. At last he cried out as loud as he could, "'Don't bring me any more hay!' The maid happened to be just then milking the cow, and hearing someone speak, but seeing nobody, and yet being quite sure it was the same voice that she had heard in the night, she was so frightened that she fell off her stool and overset the milk-pail. As soon as she could pick herself up out of the dirt, she ran off as fast as she could to her master, the parson, and said, "'Sir, sir, the cow is talking!' But the parson said, "'Woman, thou art surely mad!' However, he went with her into the cow-house to try and see what was the matter. Scarcely had he set foot on the threshold, when Tom called out, "'Don't bring me any more hay!' Then the parson himself was frightened, and thinking the cow was surely bewitched, told his man to kill her on the spot. So the cow was killed and cut up, and the stomach in which Tom lay was thrown out upon a dunghill. Tom soon set himself to work to get out, which was not a very easy task. But at last, just as he had made room to get his head out, fresh ill luck befell him. A hungry wolf sprang out, and swallowed up the whole stomach with Tom in it at one gulp, and ran away. Tom, however, was still not disheartened, and thinking the wolf would not dislike having some chat with him as he was going along, he called out, "'My good friend, I can show you a famous treat.' "'Where's that?' said the wolf. "'In such and such a house.' said Tom, describing his own father's house. "'You can crawl through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and there you will find cakes, ham, beef, cold chicken, roast pig, apple dumplings, and everything that your heart can wish.' The wolf did not want to be asked twice, so that very night he went to the house and crawled through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and ate and drank there to his heart's content. As soon as he had had enough, he wanted to get away, but he had eaten so much that he could not get out by the same way he came in. This was just what Tom had reckoned upon, but now he began to set up a great shout, making all the noise he could. "'Will you be easy?' said the wolf. "'You'll awaken everybody in the house if you make such a clatter.' "'What's that to me?' said the little man. "'You have had your frolic. Now I've a mind to be merry myself.' And he began singing and shouting as loud as he could. The woodman and his wife, being awakened by the noise, peeped through a crack in the door. But when they saw a wolf was there, you may well suppose that they were sadly frightened, and the woodman ran for his axe and gave his wife a scythe. "'Do you stay behind,' said the woodman, "'and when I have knocked him on the head, "'you must rip him up with the scythe.' Tom heard all this, and cried out, "'Father, father, I am here! "'The wolf has swallowed me!' And his father said, "'Heaven be praised! "'We have found our dear child again!' And he told his wife not to use the scythe, for fear she should hurt him. Then he aimed a great blow, and struck the wolf on the head, and killed him on the spot. And when he was dead they cut open his body, and set Tommy free. "'Ah!' said the father, "'what fears we have had for you!' "'Yes, father,' answered he, "'I have travelled all over the world, I think, in one way or other, since we parted, and now I am very glad to come home.' and get fresh air again. Why, where have you been? said his father. I have been in a mouse hole, in a snail shell, and down a cow's throat, and in a wolf's belly, and yet here I am again, safe and sound. Well, said they, you are come back, and we will not sell you again for all the riches in the world. Then they hugged and kissed their dear little son, and gave him plenty to eat and drink, for he was very hungry, and then they fetched new clothes for him, 
for his old clothes had been quite spoiled on his journey. So Master Thumb stayed at home with his father and mother in peace, for though he had been so great a traveller, and had done and seen so many fine things, and was fond enough of telling the whole story, he always agreed that, after all, there's no place like home. Rumpelstiltskin By the side of a wood, in a country a long way off, ran a fine stream of water, and upon the stream there stood a mill. The miller's house was close by, and the miller, you must know, had a very beautiful daughter. She was, moreover, very shrewd and clever, and the miller was so proud of her that he one day told the king of the land, who used to come and hunt in the wood, that his daughter could spin gold out of straw. Now this king was very fond of money, and when he heard the miller's boast, his greediness was raised, and he sent for the girl to be brought before him. Then he led her to a chamber in his palace, where there was a great heap of straw, and gave her a spinning-wheel, and said, All this must be spun into gold before morning, as you love your life. It was in vain that the poor maiden said that it was only a silly boast of her father, for that she could do no such thing as spin straw into gold. The chamber door was locked, and she was left alone. She sat down in one corner of the room, and began to bewail her hard fate. But suddenly the door opened, and a droll-looking little man hobbled in, and said, "'Good morrow to you, my good lass. What are you weeping for?' "'Alas,' said she, "'I must spin this straw into gold, and I know not how.' Ah, "'What will you give me?' said the hobgoblin to do it for you. My necklace, replied the maiden. He took her at her word, and sat himself down to the wheel, and whistled and sang, Round about, round about, lo, and behold, reel away, reel away, straw into gold. And round about the wheel went merrily, the work was quickly done, and the straw was all spun into gold. When the king came and saw this, he was greatly astonished and pleased. But his heart grew still more greedy of gain, and he shut up the poor miller's daughter again with a fresh task. Then she knew not what to do, and sat down once more to weep. But the dwarf soon opened the door and said, what will you give me to do your task? The ring on my finger, said she. So her little friend took the ring, and began to work at the wheel again, and whistled and sang, Round about, round about, lo, and behold, Reel away, reel away, straw into gold till long before morning all was done again. King was greatly delighted to see all this glittering treasure, but still he had not enough. So he took the miller's daughter to a yet larger heap, and said, All this must be spun to-night, and if it is, you shall be my queen. As soon as she was alone, that dwarf came in, and said, what will you give me to spin gold for you this third time? I have nothing left, said she. Then say you will give me, said the little man, the first little child that you may have when you are queen. That may never be, thought the miller's daughter, and as she knew no other way to get her task done, she said she would do what he asked. Round went the wheel again to the old song, and the manikin once more spun the heap into gold. The king came in the morning, and finding all he wanted, was forced to keep his word. So he married the miller's daughter, and she really became queen. At the birth of her first child she was very glad, and forgot the dwarf and what she had said. 
but one day he came into her room where she was sitting playing with her baby, and put her in mind of it. Then she grieved sorely at her misfortune, and said she would give him all the wealth of the kingdom if he would let her off, but in vain, till at last her tears softened him, and he said, I will give you three days' grace, and if during that time you tell me my name, you shall keep your child. Now the queen lay awake all night, thinking of all the odd names that she had ever heard, and she sent messengers all over the land to find out new ones. The next day the little man came, and she began with Timothy, Ichabod, Benjamin, Jeremiah, and all the names she could remember. But to all and each of them he said, Madam, that's not my name. The second day she began with all the comical names she had heard of, bandy-legs, hunchback, crookshanks, and so on. But the little gentleman still said to every one of them, Madam, that is not my name. The third day one of the messengers came back and said, I have travelled two days without hearing of any other names, but yesterday, as I was climbing a high hill, among the trees of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, I saw a little hut, and before the hut burnt a fire, and round about the fire a funny little dwarf was dancing upon one leg and singing. Merrily the feast I'll make, to-day I'll brew, to-morrow bake, Merrily I'll dance and sing, for next day will a stranger bring, Little does my lady dream, Rumpelstiltskin is my name. When the king heard this, she jumped for joy, and as soon as her little friend came, she sat down upon her throne, and called all her court round to enjoy the fun. And the nurse stood by her side with the baby in her arms, as if it was quite ready to be given up. Then the little man began to chuckle at the thought of having the poor child to take home with him to his hut in the woods, and he cried out, "'Now, lady, what is my name?' "'Is it John?' asked she. "'No, madam.' "'Is it Tom?' "'No, madam.' "'Is it Jemmy?' "'It is not.' "'Can your name be Rumpelstiltskin?' said the lady, slyly. "'Some witch told you that! Some witch told you that!' cried the little man, and dashed his right foot in a rage so deep into the floor that he was forced to lay hold of it with both hands to pull it out. Then he made the best of his way off, while the nurse laughed and the baby crowed, and all the court jeered at him for having had so much trouble for nothing, and said, we wish you a very good morning and a merry feast, Mr. Rumpelstiltskin.'